let me ask you this question. It's 2119. Both you and I are dead. Okay, it's 100 years from today. Mm. What is, if, if you've done your work correctly, and maybe if I have as well over the next 50 years, what does the landscape look like for our kids or our grand grandkids when they go out in the world of London today? What does the psychedelic access acceptance landscape look like? What do you think? That's a wonderful question. Yeah. I think it needs some regulation. I, I'm not an anarchist. I can see appeal in some aspects of anarchism, uh, at least the questioning of authority. Um, but I can see some role for um, uh, regulation, the kind of responsibility around regulation. So centers uh, for epistemic growth, for learning, self-learning and development that aren't available just for um, pathology, but for anyone who goes through a screening process um, and, and gets through that to say that this is safe enough for you to have. Um, probably what happens if it's not safe enough is that the nature of the delivery of the care becomes different. And actually, in, you know, you are treated for... <laughs> For, for that. So it's almost, I think, almost actually universal. I actually think that's a, re a, a, a reality in 100 plus years that even the most severe psychiatric diagno diagnoses could be looked at with a certain flavor, a certain approach um, with psychedelic therapy. So currently, it's a very dangerous thing to say um, because we have assumptions that, for example, people with uh, vulnerability to psychosis shouldn't go anywhere near psychedelics. They say that with they ayahuasca do. and they, yeah. they take tests and they say you shouldn't do this yeah. if you're this. And I think where we are right now, because you have you pretty much have one size fits all. You come to the retreat, you sign up, you get through and you're going to have X number of sessions and then you leave with, you know, minimal integration typically. Yeah. That's not going to fit someone with uh, um, some showing risk factors for, for psychosis. But in a hundred years, you know, maybe we've tailored things in a particular way. I'll give away a little trade secret <laughs> because I don't care that much. It's just nice to share ideas and it's fun. Um, I'm really fascinated by avatar therapy for schizophrenia, which is where, based on the voice that you hear, which is 70% of cases in schizophrenia, people have these auditory hallucinations. Typically, they have an identity, usually some persecutory figure, but you create a, a representation, a graphical digital representation, an avatar of your persecuting voice. And then through therapy, therapist interaction, you over time uh, um, modify the interaction and the content so that they stop being quite so persecutory and you, you develop a relationship of kind of understanding and, and sharing that leads to its kind of hold over you, lessening over time. Wonderful, you know, inventive idea um, uh, developed by a psychiatrist, I think, in the UK. Uh, forget his name, Julian something or other. Um, but I, I just wonder whether there's something that could be done there, because that, like any therapy, and this is the big limitation of therapy, it's not easy to do, you know, it requires some work. And a bit like meditation, actually, some people just can't do it and they're just so frustrated. I try and sit down, I watch my breath, but I, nothing happens. I can't go into it. And you hear things like that and you think, well, just a pinch of psychedelic. Right, a little know? microdose might yeah. get you there or the right set and setting, the right people, yeah. the right intention. So, you know, a hundred years, who, who knows? So right now, you know, to say such a thing is is dangerous and, and, and uh, sadly, I probably have to say I don't advocate anyone with any vulnerability to psychosis trying psychedelics but let's say our science and our methods are, are finessed and developed so much in 100 years time that, that uh, this is more or less universally available and and so um, people are, are living a life I mean this is obviously utopian fantasy and I actually Sadly, probably don't think this is going to happen, but you've got a dream to try and achieve it, haven't you? Um, so, uh, but, um, but if it was that utopia, then people would um, 
like I could think of them as being so transparent, you know, all their um, pains and um, repressed material is kind of open and accessible to them and even to others maybe because they trust them. They don't need to be defended, you know. Um, and what do they do as vocation? Well, the only thing to do as vocation is to try and relieve other people's suffering and promote well-being and wellness. So that's, that's all that anyone, anyone does. And they do a lot of nothing. They've realised that the industrious way that we've been doing things for the last few hundred years is, has created suffering. So there's a realisation that we need to stop. <laughs> so back to the 10-hour work week or no work week. Yeah. Well, maybe with some AI, we won't be working in a hundred years. Well, it could give even more kind of, yeah, leisure time. <laughs>